welcome to the sales and marketing podcast for decorators. My name is John Mears and today I am joined by Russell from RDP Painters and Decorators. How are you, my friend? I'm good, John. I'm good. How are you, mate? Yeah, superb. Thank you. Sun's out. It's been a, a good day. How? Uh, what have you been up to? You've been uh, had a bit of a hot one today, have you? Yeah, we're just having the conversation off uh, off record. Um, but yeah, I've been stuck in a little box room with a very small opening light, uh, getting very sweaty, unfortunately. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not not one to criticise the, the nice weather, mate. I'm never going to wish it away, but it, it has been a bit of an unpleasant couple of days. Luckily, I'm starting a new job tomorrow, so hopefully, hopefully a bit more ventilation. Good. You got any outsides booked for this year? Yeah, too many. Too many, <laughs> mate. Um, it's a bit of a different subject. You'd probably do a whole podcast on that one. But I've actually yeah. decided as from next year, I'm going to stop. Um, it just causes too much havoc with my diary. I, I intended to start doing exteriors in May. Um, and obviously, it was a complete washout. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's one that's going to be crossed off my my list of uh, of things that I do. Unfortunately, as from next year, I've been threatening it for a few years now to stop doing exterior work because I've got enough to keep me inside. But it's uh, it's a bit of a double edged sword. I enjoy working outside. Um, love it when the weather's nice, but it, it just causes chaos with my diary. And the, you book something in for three months time, and you, you, it, it, it's a real gamble on the weather. Uh, so yeah. As from next year, that's it, mate. So, so I should probably savor, <laughs> savor the last of them <laughs> for this year. So yeah, I've got a, f a few big ones to get ticked off. Yeah, I'll, I'll hold you to it. I think we'll have a chat this time next year because I know a lot of decorators <laughs> who every year say, "This is it for me. This is the last of the exteriors." <laughs> but no, I don't exactly what you mean. Everyone says the same. It's just it's nightmare with, with your nightmare with your diary, and uh, it's although they're good, good and good money in them usually. It's. Uh, yeah, the, you, trying you don't to, have to trying lose. To fit them in. Yeah, you, you don't have to lose many days for that profit to go away, though. Unfortunately, um, I used to tend to bank on it being one day a week. You know, you, you'd sort of book in five and hope to complete four. But uh, I mean, as May this year just showed, it, it was about four weeks solid. I couldn't even couldn't get on, couldn't get on the job at all. And although I pulled other work in, it just it turns my diary upside down. And you know, you've got to start juggling customers and moving dates and hoping people will move if the sun's shining it's it's no good no and that leads neatly on to it we're talking about money uh today's topic and what i want to ask you about is how can you increase your prices um now this is something i get asked a lot and it's something you get asked a lot so for the people that don't know you uh russ uh doesn't just run rdp painters and decorators which is a third generation painting and decorating firm uh, but you've also set up RDP Academy which is uh, a group that helps other businesses trade painters and decorators uh, you've got a couple of diff different options I mean you've got a, a monthly right. setup where people can access your support group and you do um, zoom calls and stuff like that and you're also offering one-to-one -one, uh, coaching sessions that's right. Um, now, I want to talk about that a bit more towards the end, um, but I just want to give people a bit of background on the fact that it's you're not just a painter and decorator, but you've also got a lot of experience in helping other people with the business side of things, which is, as you know, something that's, that's quite important to me. And it's something that I'm trying to do, and it's essentially what this whole podcast is about. So you've, yeah, sure. you've taken, taken a lot of businesses through the process of they've come to you and said, I want to put my prices up. How do I do yeah. that? So um, I guess when we talk about increasing prices, the start for me is is when should you be doing it? Are there some mm. some clear cut signs that? You know, I, be, I believe so, you? John. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's what I talk to people a lot in, in the coaching sessions. Um, a lot of the time people approach putting the prices up without a plan. Now, to me, you've got to have a plan in place. You've got to have some kind of formula. It can be different for everyone. It can vary by area. But there's, there's got to be some kind of plan that you're going to stick to in order to move forwards, because otherwise it's very hard to sort of monitor your, your increases or, or whether it's going to work and how much work you're converting off the back of that. Um, now, what I advise people to do, and I'm quite happy to discuss what my sort of parameters are with it, um, I advise people to set 
a safety net or a safety barrier with work in front of them. Because as with any kind of value in any kind of product, it's dictated supply and demand. So if demand is higher than supply, the prices are going to go up and vice versa. So at the moment, we're very fortunate in that, to me at the moment, it's a fantastic time to be in the building trades. Um, the demand for services, in my opinion, is higher than the amount of skilled services out there. Um, in fact, I was looking, I actually put a post into the academy a couple of days ago, which was a, a survey from my builder. Uh, and they surveyed people and it was recorded that 58% of people across the UK noted or said that they believed that there was a shortage of skilled tradesmen and that 37% of people had had difficulty in securing a tradesman when they'd needed one. Now, to me, that says a lot. It says a lot about mm. the state of the market. It says a lot about the opportunities that are available. So getting back onto the way that I look at this, it's a case of you have to set yourself a safety barrier. And what I mean by that is work in advance of yourself. Yeah. So you have to set yourself a level where you're going to be comfortable. Now, me personally, four months is what I set. Um, I mean, you could drop that down to three. You could push it up to six. It would be to suit your own business. Um, and what I then do is once I've got four months worth of work ahead of me, any inquiries that come in that are prepared to wait that period of time and that I then subsequently go and price, I will inflate my price by a predetermined amount. So I'll look at that. And again, this can be adjusted depending on where you are, what your current price levels are um, and changed accordingly to that. But I tend to move my prices between 10 and 20 percent. Now, obviously, if you're at the higher end of the market when it comes to day rates, 20 percent can be a lot of money. You know, mm. For example, if you were charging 200 pounds a day, that's a big jump up to 240. So you'd probably just put 10 percent on and look, you know, go to 220. Um, if you're charging lower end rates at the moment, say you're only charging 120, you could put 20 percent on that. Like Personally, I think you could quite easily put an extra, what's that, £24 a day, so you're mm -hmm. up to 144 that, that would be achievable. Um, but set that target, you know, get yourself your safety barrier. Okay, I've got three months' work ahead of me now, so what I'm going to do is everything that I'm quoting to be booked in after that date, I'm going to put 20% on. You can go out, you can do those quotes, and then you've got a little bit of market exploration then, because you can look at it and you can go, right, okay, I've put my prices up 20%, I'm converting the same amount of work as it was before, which is obviously going to say to you, you're too cheap effectively for the area you're in if you're still getting all your quotes. Yeah. Um, so again, it's supply and demand. And to me, it's also a way of thinning your workload out and getting the better customers in uh, by lumping your prices up. You know, you're naturally going to move some work away that are looking for the cheaper work. Uh, but personally, I believe the way that the country is heading, I think all the prices are going to start going up and continue to. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are bogged down by other people's expectations and um, sort of the traditional view of the decorating industry, which is that we're at the bottom of the rung. Um, but, you know, people need to, a lot of it's mindset. And once you break out of that mindset and you start setting your own limits rather than being uh, pigeonholed by other people's limits and what, you know, you, you may, I've uh, I've grown up around decorators my whole life, and if I were to talk to a lot of the lads that I've known for 20 years now, they would still be saying to me, "Oh, bloody hell, you can't charge more than X amount." But that's their limits. Yeah. I've pushed well beyond that, and I'm, I'm still pulling the work in. So that's what I mean by having a plan. You have to have a set amount, set plan, and then you can monitor it. You know, you can monitor. You're in, okay. I've increased my prices by 10%. I'm now converting the same amount, or actually, I'm converting. 10% less. But if you're converting 10% less work and you're earning 10% more, you're still just as well off, um, which is something else that I've, I've talked about a lot within the academy is not being scared to put your prices up. Because if you do increase your prices by 20%, you can afford to do 20% less work and still earn the same amount of money. Mm. 100%. And I think people are, even if you're not closing all of your quotes, you're probably still I think most decorators, certainly most decorators I talk to, if they do 10 quotes, they expect to get at least nine of them. Uh, yeah. And, but you're always doing, I mean, you were saying 
earlier that at one point you were doing two or three quotes an evening. Uh, and, you know, you had a lot of guys on at the time, but I think decorators, especially if you're if you're self-employed and you're working on your own, or maybe it's you and one other guy, you only need you know four average jobs a month to stay busy. That's that's you maxed out. So even if you found okay, you've only got to find ten quotes, two ten quotes a month. You've only really got to close four of those to mm. stay busy for the whole month. Uh, yeah, complete. So your conversion rate. And I think, like you said, there's a there's a mindset thing to it. There's people get uh, understandably get very nervous if people start saying no. It's like if you get two or three people decline your quotes in a row, then your head starts spinning. You're like, oh shit, am I ever going to be able to close another job again? Am I charging too much? What was I thinking? But as soon as you, I mean, I don't know what your your conversion rate is, but I think anything over 50% really, and you can yeah, start, looking at, start looking at putting your prices up. My, my personal conversion rate's quite high uh, because mm -hmm. a lot of my work is recommendation and, and word of mouth, um, yeah. so it naturally converts quite highly. That said, I turn away a hell of a lot of work before it even gets to the quote stage. Yeah. I would say on most weeks, I'm turning away three to four inquiries just purely based on time scale. So they want the work done within the next few months and I can't accommodate that. So the, the people that are prepared to wait a bit longer are people that tend to know me and they particularly want my services. But the good thing with having that plan and having a percentage increase based on a sort of time period, a safety net, is if you're not getting the work, if you are starting to not convert your prices, you know you've still got that safety net yeah. and you know that you can always revert back. You can take that 10% off to a, a level where you know that you are converting your prices. Mm -hmm. So a level you're effectively comfortable with and you know works, but it, it's having the courage to push out beyond that. But you've still got that safety barrier behind you. Um, I mean, obviously, it's going to cause a problem if somebody's got no work ahead of them and they've decided that they're not happy on 120 a day. They're going to start charging 180 a day. You know, that's not the thing to do. You, you do it once you've built up a portfolio of work ahead of you that's going to keep you safe and keep the bills paid. Then you've got the luxury and the freedom to experiment. Um, and that's just like I said, my time period is four months, um, mm. but I'm probably quite high end on the scale of price anyway. Um, you might find some people want six months, some people might want two months or, or whatever. You know, it's, that's a personal decision. You know, that, yeah. that some people have got to reflect on their own commitments for that. Um, but to me, it's very important to have a plan. Uh, I speak to a lot of people and it's very vague and it's just, oh, you know, I'm, I'm charging 150 a day. I'm going to put my prices up to 170. And there's no, they don't collect any data from it. It's just, yeah. it, it's, it's very sort of like gunshot, you know. Um, but yeah, it, you, to me, you've got to have a plan, you've got to have a formula and you've got to keep a note, keep a note of what you're winning, what you're not winning, where your prices are, what your price levels are. And it, it gives you something to work from then. Yeah, a hundred percent. Just, um, yeah, two things. So a three, four month buffer, um, a safety net, as you, as you say, I think that's, um, decorators are probably be quite comfortable with that. I think. You, obviously, you want more and more, and you want all that additional safety. But sometimes you just got to look at it and go, "Do you know what? Even if you look at like what it's like being an employee of a company, as, mm. as an employee of a company, you might think that you're in a safe place, but really, you're only one month away from being out of work because that's Absolutely. that's your notice period. So, if as a, a self-employed person, if you're booked up three months in advance, that's actually more secure than anyone in employee paid work, really. Yeah. Uh, so once you're two, three months, and I think I did a survey recently, three months seem to be about the sweet spot. Most people don't really want to wait longer than three months unless, mm -hmm. like you say, it's a recommendation, it's repeat work or something like that. Uh, for a new inquiry, when someone decides, uh, you know, I want to go out and hire a decorator, typically they don't really want to wait more than three months. If you can't fit it in, and these would be the ones you're turning away quite often, I'm sure. So yeah. you'll turn them away because they go, oh, yeah, well, I've decided I want it done and I want it done next month. And it's like, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not the guy for that. But good luck trying to find someone yeah. um, who, who can do it in that time frame. To be honest, John, I'm happy to do it. I think of it a little bit like fishing. You know, it's, it's a fish that's come to me. I don't want it. I've thrown it back in. Somebody else is going to catch that. Mm. So, I, you know, I'm very much I focus on myself, my business. 
Um, it's I think you you get more used to it the longer you're in business. Certainly when you first start out, every opportunity and lead that comes in feels special. It feels yeah. like you've got to jump on it. You take it very personally, whether you get it or you don't get it. And people are always inclined to take everything on and put themselves under pressure um, and then potentially risk actually delivering an inferior sort of like job or, or workload because they've put themselves under that pressure. I think when you've got a bit of experience behind you, um, you realize, and as I said at the moment, I think the statistics say it all, that there's actually a hell of a lot of work out there. Um, and provided you've built yourself, your business in the correct way, um, you, you're always going to have those opportunities. So I'm quite happy to turn work away that doesn't suit me. I, I don't really give it two thoughts because I know someone else is going to pick that up. And if it is somebody that wants work to in short notice, like you said, good luck finding them. But there will be those people that are just starting out and they haven't got such a long lead time and that work could filter down to them. Um, I mean, the whole industry is almost a, a pyramid system, you know, you have to have the uh, the lower levels in order to maintain the upper levels. So it, yeah. it's all um, it's all live and let live, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So if we go with, you know, step one, the, the, the start of this is you've got to have a plan. Um, got to have a plan. Build up that safety net um, before you before you do it. Uh, and then very important is track what you're doing so track how many inquiries you're getting track how many of those inquiries are turning into meetings how many of those quotes are being accepted and see what's happening to your conversion rate are you are you converting less does that mean that you're not your your uh, safety net is shrinking uh, yeah. you're not booked up three months in advance anymore are you struggling so track it because it's a it's a very emotional thing the sales side of thing when mm. someone says no and declines your quote like if you get two in a row then it can really start messing with your head but you might have got the last 18 jobs in a row but you get two yeah. people say no and you think oh shit everything's fucked uh so you've got to track it so that you can take the emotion out of those numbers and understand what is actually going on so you don't make any you know knee-jerk reactions and Put your prices back down again when you probably don't need to absolutely um, the next part for me is uh so when you're putting your prices up this has to be sort of in line with you've got to be confident that you are delivering a, a, an improved a higher value service um yeah. and that starts with something else that i know your your people talk to you a lot about and that is the quoting process itself mm. uh, now if we talk about 100 pound a day 120 pound a day um, quotation coming in from a decorator like that you it might be a text message or something like that saying it's yeah. X amount for labor plus you buy the paint or whatever job done now when you start charging those higher end numbers that doesn't cut it anymore so what's for, for people to understand what's your mm. current quoting process how do you what are the sort of steps involved and how do you present it Okay, so I think, as I mentioned before, with the whole pyramid system, there's a level of service, like you quite rightly said, that would apply to each demographic within the trade. So there's a place for the lower priced work. And like you said, you know, they're not going to expect the full, uh, you know, fancy estimates and quoting system, the same sort of service. They might accept a, a text message and all the rest of it if you're looking to push your prices up therefore you're looking to get into a better demographic of work then everything's got to be on point so mm -hmm. your image from point one so your first point of call obviously is probably your phone call or your email or your social media message um you know you've got to address that in a professional manner that's your, your first very first impression they're going to get is that initial sort of like contact um, and beyond then I'd probably say the most important thing is that first sight of you on the doorstep so again it's making sure everything to do with your business image is on point um, and it's little things like me personally I keep a all of my workwear is, is printed up it's all logoed up but obviously at work you know we get dirty unless you're certain decorators that manage to keep all paint <laughs> off them which is a magic trick that I want to learn one day um, but yeah, so, you know, we get dirty at work, but the one thing I do make sure I do, I've got a clean printed soft shell jacket that I keep in the van. Um, so it's always there. That's clean and tidy. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll pop that on or a clean T-shirt if the weather's hot. So that first impression is a good one. Um, 
me personally, I've, I've got quite a new written up van. So again, that goes towards, and if you're looking to push into the, the high end domestic market, it's ticking all of these boxes. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were talking obviously just before this um, about the, the post I put out regarding um, the psychology behind sort of the, the whole process and the consumer um, and the fact that we live in the consumer society now rather than in us. Do, do you want me to shall I touch on yeah, that Yeah, now? please do because oh, yeah, I thought it was a brilliant post. So yeah, no, I'd explain for, for everyone the, the difference and what's been, what's been going on uh, with yeah, society sure. and how that's affected things. So briefly without making it too much of a history lesson. So in years gone by, we lived in an industrial society. So in that period of time, you were kind of born into a class. You were born lower class, working class, middle class, whatever it might be. And people were pretty proud of their status. But whatever you were born into, it was very hard to break out of. Now, society has changed in that we're now living in a consumer society. And what that means, you can see examples of it all around you. You look at your latest reality star. Um, you know, you can be born on any background. You can be born, and this isn't knocking how council housing at all, but you can be born on a council estate and you know you're judged now by what you consume so if you have gone on reality tv and you're now rocking around in the latest designer gear driving a lamborghini your image and perception in society is now raised um and the points i made before were the fact that you don't buy a rolex watch because it tells the best time you buy it because what it says about you you mm -hmm. don't buy a gucci handbag because it holds uh godly amount of items you buy it because what carrying a gucci handbag says about you and it's yeah. how you're perceived and it's how people now build their identity now it might sound like i've gone off down a track a little bit but when you pull that back into the decorating world it's the same as your image when you approach high-end customers so when you turn up it's not just what your image is saying about you it's what your image is saying about them and what i mean by that is it's who they want on their drive. It's who they want their neighbours to see working at their house. You know, they, again, being I mean, there's always the exception to the rule. You know, there's always the multi-million pound house that's going to be happy for somebody in their dirty old night track suit to be walking in and out with bed sheets rather than dust sheets. Yeah. Um, but by and large, you know, uh, image says a lot these days. It's, society, it's the society we now live in and it's kind of the rules that a lot of us abide by. Um, so if you're working on luxury houses, a lot of these people will want luxury decorators. And what you'll find is once you tick all those image boxes, once your image is on point, your social media is all on point and it all combines together the social media, the van, the workwear, your overall presentation is that the focus isn't then so much on the price. It's more on the product that they're getting in just the same way that people don't shell out five to ten grand on a Rolex because they're looking for the best timepiece. The same way that you can charge more money as a decorator because of your whole image being complete. Um, mm -hmm. And it just plays into the mind of the consumer, the mind of the client, the mind of the high end customer. Um, that image is everything you know they're, they're going to look at you and expect a high-end service and you've got to be able to deliver that you know not for a minute sort of going down a fake it till you make it route yeah, you've yeah. got to be able to deliver the, the product but you're going to find a lot more success and in terms of being able to charge more earn more and be more successful you've got to have all those elements ticked you know like you said you can't be dropping a multi-million pound house a text message saying yeah two grand mate yeah. and expecting to get that work it's not going to happen um so you have to make sure that you're catering to the demographic that you're working for yeah 100 percent. i think that's that's really brilliantly brilliantly put um and it's i think people massively underestimate the importance of that side of things and the image and and as you said it's it's um when someone hires you it's saying something about them uh mm. and so you could have, say you've got your, your multi-million pound house, two decorators are quoting for it. Uh, let's say first guy turns up and he is 120 quid a day. He turns up in a rusty old transit that's barely still going, steps out in his nightshell suit, covered in paint. Yeah, as a quick look round, sends a text message with the quote. Now, 
put him next to another decorator who comes in at 200 pound a day or 250 pound a day or something like that uh they come in with their beautiful nice new sign written van they've got the soft shell jacket on they're clean they smell good the 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 whole quotation is delivered in a nice uh in a nice email or even printed and, and given to them these two decorators at this point they could have shown the same portfolio of work as, as a skill the actual product that the customer is buying could be exactly the same it's like you know it's yeah. the rolex watch and the casio watch Absolutely. the product they're telling the time is exactly the same yeah uh, so the 120 quid a decorator could have exactly the same practical skills as the 250 quid decorator but there's only one person that's going to win that job for the multi-million pound house and that's the high-end decorator because Completely. it is that they want the nice van sat on the um sat on the drive they want to know that when mrs jones next door goes oh who was that decorator i want them to come and do my house they know that you can then comfortably go oh yes try him he's very expensive but uh, he does a fantastic job yeah. and they won't be embarrassed going Oh yeah, uh, we only hired this guy because he was really cheap. Actually, he farts a lot, and the quality of his work was okay, but <laughs> he was a bit of a nightmare to have around the house. And it's it, yeah, it looks a nightmare. It's a strange, it's a strange thing. Um, and again, to dip into the psychology of things, sometimes when you charge more, people put more value on you, oh. um, and everything comes down to value. And I don't know whether this is a good thing, really, but uh, I've heard several of my customers recommend me to friends, and I've heard that line. I've been stood in a kitchen with a customer who's been on the phone to a friend and he said, oh, yeah, I've got Russ here, our decorator. And that's the other thing you get referred to. This is our decorator. Yeah. Thinking, I'm not your decorator. I'm everyone's decorator. I'm, <laughs> I'm my own decorator. But yeah. they refer to you almost as a possession. Um, and it's, I've got Russ here, our decorator. And it's, oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I definitely recommend him. He's not cheap, but he does an amazing job and he turns up and he, you know, he protects the floors and he does this, he's clean, he's tidy, he's all the rest. Yeah. I've had that and I've heard it firsthand that he's not cheap line. Um, but it's almost said as a good thing. It's not said in a derogatory that, way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because what they're saying is he's not cheap. We can afford him. Yeah. yeah and again, it comes down to that consumer mindset and the way that people look to elevate themselves within the society we now live in buy what they consume buy what they buy and you can be one of those consumables and if you can target and market that correctly then you're going to be the winner there you're playing the game but yeah. you're the one coming out of it well um i mean to touch on a contract that i did a couple of years ago uh, it was actually a contact that came through facebook um i know a lot of people have got varying opinions on the quality of work that comes through facebook but again i believe that if you market correctly it can be done well uh, it was an inquiry that came through facebook and it turned out it was a multi multi million pound property that we did and i turned up to do the quote and it was a whole house there was 22 rooms to quote um and we won the quote and they've become one of my best customers uh we're tied into a maintenance contract to maintain the exterior of the property. Um, fantastic customers to work for. Um, and they actually said to me, I was by far the most expensive quote. Not just the most expensive, <laughs> by far. Yeah. Um, but they liked me and the way that I dealt with the business far more than anyone else that came out. And mm -hmm. they did say that they had a couple of, it will be around about this kind of prices whereas yeah. mine was professionally written or delivered one of the other things i also like to do and again i tell the academy members to try and stick to it is to return the quote quite promptly so my personal sort of like target on that is 48 hours so yeah. not the same day that can sound a bit too keen again there's a bit of a sweet spot um but 48 hours from time of visit get your quotes in because you've also got a lot of customers that are keen to jump especially when they know you're busy what you don't want to do is wait too long. Somebody else gets a quote in after a couple of days and they say, oh, do you know what? You're busy. We'll book in. We'll just go with you. And then that person asks for a deposit and that's it. They're tied in there. By the time they get your quote, it's already gone. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the timekeeping can be quite a key element as well. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great position to get to. And, and look, I'm sure it takes a, a long time to get to that point. But when you are essentially you're marketing yourself as your hot property you are you know this is russ he's expensive but he's good and if you can get him you know he's our decorator if you can get him to come to do work for you then brilliant we recommend him but 
He's always busy because he's that good. He's always booked up a long way in advance. And that's why I think that, yeah, I love that. I've, he's our decorator. People can be really quite proud to go, yeah, we've got the most exclusive, the most expensive decorator. We can afford that. We, we've got the connections. And people love that. And when you can get to that point, then superb. And, and like you say, price almost becomes... Um, it's not even a consideration. They almost they almost want it to be more expensive. And but there's no reason, uh, provided your skills are competent. Yeah. There's no reason that anybody out there, anyone listening to this, any business, there's no reason anyone can't put themselves in the position that I'm in and several others are doing high end work are in. You know, um, it, it's it's quite a, an easy formula to success once you understand what the customer wants, and that's not just the work. You know, and that's that's a big thing. Uh, I think I heard you mention on one of your other podcasts that by the time you turn up to do the work, that that's money in the bank. You know, yeah. it's every fit, all the hard work's done. You you've won the contract, you've done the sales. That's, that's all gone well. Um, you could be the best painter and decorator, the best tradesman on the on in the UK, but if your marketing is terrible and nobody knows how good you are, mm. and you can't demonstrate before you pick up a brush that you're good then your, your business won't be a success and, yeah. and that's what it comes down to is the difference between tradesmen and businessmen um and that's where i'm trying to bridge the gap mm. no 100 percent agree and yeah it's um I, I like the i want to talk a little bit about the mindset of it because you mentioned earlier i think there is a a mindset people are i've got a lot of you see it a lot on facebook the classic line, you can't charge that where I come from. You yeah. won't get away with that. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, uh, and I think uh, so much of, of putting your prices up is snapping out of that and just going, look, um, and you, you said just before the call, you've got to listen to the market. The market decides how much you're worth. And, and going back to what we were just saying, look, if you're charging loads of money and your work isn't up to scratch and everything around that, then you'll get found out quite quickly. So you can't just jack your prices up to whatever you want. But you've got to look at, you know, what's the market saying? If I put my prices up to 250 quid a day and everybody's still accepting my quotes, then okay, the market deems that I am worth that much. Absolutely. Uh, and, and you were saying else, it, it's supply and demand, isn't it? 100%. I think that dictates everything. Mm. Um, and there's a, a very simple saying, it sounds oversimplified, but I, Again, one that I like to say to people in the academy is you are worth exactly what somebody is prepared to pay. Mm. That's it. It's as simple as that. And if the supply is so much under the demand, then the prices within the entire building industry are just going to continue to go up. Um, I've had some really insightful, really interesting conversations with people over the last year or so. Um, a couple of months back now, I was actually working for a heart surgeon. Uh, in uh, an area called Solihull, a uh, lovely area, multi-million pound house, chatting to a heart surgeon. And he was telling me what he earned, which was around about, I think he said £88,000 a year working for the NHS. Um, and we were just having conversations. Now, I know quite a few builders that are earning six figures plus. Yeah. You know? um, and it all does come down to this supply and demand. And I truly believe that this is the best time. It's the best. I've been in the building trades, the decorating industry over 20 years now. This is the best time to get in because the supply is continually going down and the demand is consistent. Um, and as I, as I said, I mean, it, just the overwhelming public opinion, if 58 percent of people interviewed are saying that they believe there's a shortage in the building trades, I mean, that says every, you know, that says everything you need to know, mm -hmm. um, and people will be prepared to get paying a little bit more to get hold of the services they need. So it might be that in you know ten years' time, it, it, I remember years ago I got stuck on a shelf for a long, long time, hundred pound a day. Yeah, that was it. Back in back in, and you just couldn't charge any more. You'd be laughed at. You charge more than hundred pound. It was a ridiculous notion that you could charge a hundred pound more than hundred pound a day, yeah. um, and that's just been blown out of the water now. It's fantastic to see, and I, I see decorators talking about charging two hundred, two twenty, two forty. Um, why not? You know, if somebody's prepared in five years' time to be paying decorators three hundred day, three hundred a day on average, four hundred a day on average, why not? Mm. I think as long as you're delivering a quality service, as long as you deliver what you sell, 
then nobody's getting ripped, ripped off because you're delivering exactly what you're selling. You know, you don't hear uh, to go back to it and love the Rolex watch, but you don't see a single person go and buy a Rolex watch, walk out the jewelers and go, I've just been ripped off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, Christ, I've, you know, can you believe they've just charged me eight grand for a watch? Yeah. All it does is tell the time, you know, it, it's all con you've got to put it in context. Yeah, I think and I, I think a lot of decorators have got a number in their head. Like you said, for you a long time ago, it was 100 quid a day. And some people it would be 140, 160, 180 or yeah. whatever. And they'll just think, that's it. That's the ceiling. I can't charge more than that. But it, I know... I know a number of decorators um, who get paid more than a hundred grand a year working for somebody else. Uh, so I don't even know what that is as a day rate, but it's probably three, four hundred quid a day. Uh, and it's just, I don't know, how do we get, how can you get people out of that mindset of this is the most you can charge and get them into the mindset of, let's see what I'm actually worth. Is it about that? Is it about how much you feel like you're worth or is it you just, you don't want to take the risk? I don't think it's about what you feel that you're worth because when mm -hmm. you talk to people, most people, you know, you get talking to people and they're, they're generally quite proud about what they do. So I think a lot of it is preconceived ideas or other people's ideas based on who you surround yourself with. If you surround yourself with people that say you can't charge more than or this area you can't charge more than. And I have this conversation. Some of the lads that have joined the academy is quite a few down in London. Um, and we've had this conversation where they're like, well, that's kind of the limit round here. Now, I live and work in the Midlands. So in theory, a less profitable area. Um, and I tell them what I'm earning versus what they're earning. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, how can you charge that? Well, I, I do and I am. I'm oh, doing I am and I'm converting work so and I sort of say well have you ever tried charging more well no because I've been told I can't I'll try it and see what happens yeah um the big issue another thing to touch on with mindset I think is um the, the conception of being busy that people sorry for alarm going off people put a lot of value on being busy um, and the best the best example of that I can give you is me personally, if I were to go down the pub and meet up with my mates, if I went and saw 10 of my mates, first question they would say to me, all right, mate, how are you doing? You keeping busy? Yeah. <laughs> or got plenty on. Yeah. Now, being busy or having plenty on in a business sense means nothing because you can be a busy fool. You can be earning very little, but you could be I could be booked up for two years and earning very, very little. But people put value on staying busy. Whereas yeah. in reality, you know, you could work five days a week at £100 a day or you could work three days a week at £200 a day and be better off. Mm. But only have three days of work a week. Uh, yeah. People would still judge you as, oh, he's not very busy. That means, you know. Um, and I think that's one of the things, one of the, the elements that we have to change in order to adapt mindset to be profitable is to stop focusing on being busy. Stop focusing on it being a good thing. And it is you speak to people who talk about, oh, I'm rushed off my feet, I'm doing seven days a week, uh, I'm doing 10 hour days. And although on one hand they're moaning about it, it's also worn like a badge of honor that that means their business is doing well. I disagree. Yeah. I disagree. Um, my view on it is if I've got to work seven days a week, there's something wrong because I'm not earning enough in the five days. Yeah. Um, and if I'm doing 10 hour days, same thing, there's something wrong there. Um, you know, there's, there's something out of balance. Um, yeah, I, I think that's got to change. Mm. You know, uh, the focus on staying busy or being busy has got to change to a value focus. Um, and people need to think a little bit more like a business than an individual and try and adapt their mindset and move their, their goals. Um, ultimately, is allowing other people to set your limits rather than setting your own. And the only way you'll ever find your own limits is to explore them mm. you know it's like anything i mean a marathon runner or a runner only knows how far they can run when they try so it's no different to quote in and, and the rest of it unless you try putting your prices up and see what the response is by all means you know if, if you put your prices up 20 percent and your conversion rate drops down to zero pull it back <laughs> <You know>? yeah <laughs> pull, it, pull it back go back to where you knew that you were converting but people are people are almost scared to try um, and I think people would be 
pleasantly surprised if, if they roll the dice on that one. Uh, I certainly have. You know, it's a process that I've used myself. It's tried and tested. Um, and I'm certainly earning more now than I was in the past. Um, it's worked well for me. I'm still putting my prices up. I'm still converting heavily. I'm turning away, you know, more work than I'm taking on. So it, it says a lot to me about the current condition of the building trades. I, I think there's so much potential. People have just got to open their eyes to that. Yeah, I think the the home improvement industry as a whole is absolutely booming at the moment. So now, just in general, is is a great time to start exploring these things. Um, so let's try and uh, sum it up into a simple process. So first step to, to increasing your prices is get your plan in order um, and get a safety net there, which you know, you've got to look at it yourself. If you're comfortable with a one month safety net or it needs to be six months, then fine. But I think as a general rule, I would say three to four. If you've got three to four months of work in front of you, that's a pretty good position to go. OK, now let's start looking at increasing prices. Yeah. Um, how much to increase it by? Depending on where you already are on the scale, if you're on the lower end or on the higher end, you want to be looking at sort of 10 to 20 percent increase, I think, is. I think on the lower end, you, you, you could comfortably do 20%. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't feel that that's a huge jump these days. But if you yeah. are on the higher end, um, then yeah, maybe look at 10. Whatever's comfortable. You know, yeah. you can do 10, and if it doesn't change anything, you can put that other 10 on, uh, which you'll naturally do. You're, you know, you're, And the great thing then is it gives you that incentive because you, you know you're still converting. Okay, I've up my prices. So you know you've given yourself a pay rise in four months' time, three months' time. You're now going to be having a 10% pay rise. Mm. And there's no end point on that, John. Yeah. You, you can keep doing that every three months, every three months. And I think people will be pleasantly surprised at where they start finding resistance because I think yeah. it's probably going to be a lot higher than what they believe. Yeah. I think you said, um, you know, find, find an increase that you're comfortable with. I, I would say you almost want to find, you almost want to put your prices up by just that little bit that makes you feel slightly uncomfortable about it because then. And then when that happens, you go, oh, yeah. And you'll probably find that, like you say, your conversion rate won't change. You'll keep getting the work. You'll keep you busy. And then you think, oh, OK. And that when the next time, three, six yeah. months later or whatever, you can you can push it, increase a bit more. So, so yeah, get your three months um, buffer in place, your safety net. Start tracking your conversion rates. Start tracking how many quotes you're putting in and how many you're getting back and make sure that you are, you know, at a conversion rate that you're comfortable with and that is keeping you busy enough. Um, I think it's worth saying that if you keep putting your prices up and you get to a point where you do find that resistance that you're talking about and people start knocking you back, then yes, look at the numbers. Don't do it on an emotional basis. Look at the numbers yeah. and see, OK, my conversion rate is not working here and backtrack. But don't stop there. I think you then you backtrack and go, right, OK, so the market resisted to that. 10% increase. Mm. So what do I need to do to the rest of my business to beef it up? Do I need to improve my marketing, my image? Yeah. Do I need newer vans or something like that? Are there other things in the business? Do I need newer tools? Do I need the latest, you know, Festool, Death, uh, Dustless Sander or whatever? Look at all the other aspects of your business think, and think, how um, can I improve that so that probably people can take this? Probably an important point to mention here, um, something that I'd kind of, I suppose, glossed over a little, is within the decorating industry, obviously, certain elements of the trade, certain demographics, you can naturally charge more for. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing spraying, uh, high-end wallpaper hanging, things like that will naturally attract a bit more money than yeah. your straightforward dashing out a, a magnolia on magnolia house. Um, so you do, obviously, all I'm getting at with it is you've got to be aware of the demographic of work that you're doing. So you yeah. could be potentially at the peak of what you could charge for a particular demographic, but not another. So if you're, like I say, you know, pay attention to your demographic. If you're bashing out rentals, your ceiling is going to be lower than that of doing high end spray work or, as I say, paper hanging or the more niche, the more specialist mm -hmm. jobs within the industry. So you do have to pay a little bit of attention to that as well. But by and large, yeah, absolutely what you're saying is the... Uh, the path to path to the winning <laughs> yeah so i think i think generally it is just you know it's get your safety net and then just start testing it and 
yeah and, and let the market decide how much you're Absolutely. worth not what's going on in your head not what Absolutely. other decorators say you can charge let the market decide how much you're worth and, and as you've said a couple of times i think most people will be pleasantly surprised how much more the market values them uh, than what they're actually charging now i think a lot of people I think nine out of 10 decorators I talk to could put 20 quid on their day rate tomorrow oh, and yeah. not see a difference at all. I'm um, 100% with you. Uh, and that's just your starter. Uh, once you start looking at other aspects and really start testing it and pushing it, I think, yeah, there's there's so much more money out there. Mm. And a lot of it is just is the mindset and, and not being brave enough to test it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the customer's never going to push you on. <laughs> the customer's <No. laughs> never going to push you to charge more money. So you could be, again, an incredibly talented decorator, but if you're set on 150 a day, then your customers are never going to prompt you to up that. So it, it's only got to come from within, really, and uh, to sound a little bit philosophical on it. But if, you know, you've got to value yourself in order to increase your value, because if you don't value yourself and your services, then you're never going to put your prices up. Yeah, you know, you have to recognise the the supply and demand element of the market. Hundred um, percent. Okay, no, I think that's um, I think that's perfect. I, I think that's going to help a lot of people, which is brilliant. I appreciate your time on this. Um, okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the academy. So RDP Academy. Uh, firstly, can you tell us how can people find some more information on this website? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, obviously, we're quite active on Instagram. So there's RDP Painters and Decorators and there's RDP Business Academy that are both linked on Instagram. So if you find either of those, you'll be able to find a link to the website. Um, and am I right to do a quick, a very quick run through of what we do? 100%. That's exactly what I was going to ask you to do. So, yeah, Fantastic. I think if, if, could you... It's always nice to know where it started, why it started. Um, okay, so, yeah, sure. Yeah, tell us how it started, why it started, what how, what it was born out of, and then, and then yeah, the different services that are available. Okay, um, I think, in honesty, it was started off the back of a conversation about how there's very little support out there for people once they go self-employed. Um, there's a lot of talented tradesmen that, uh, cast out there when they go self-employed with not a lot of business knowledge. Now, I touched earlier on the fact that being a good tradesman and a good businessman, two different things. So what I wanted to do was bridge that gap or offer a support network for people. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying I know it all, but I've been around the block a bit. I've learned from a lot of my own mistakes and a lot of what I can pass on is from things I've done wrong myself in my business journey. Um, which has been going on for 20 odd years. Now, I've worked in most demographics across painting and decorating, private, commercial, big, small, all, all the rest of it. Um, but um, I think the best way to, yeah, the, the best way to sum it up is to, to bridge that gap. Um, in fact, what, what I will say, uh, I had a review left by um, one of the Academy members, probably my favorite review to date. And I'm probably slightly misquoting here because I'm going off the top of my head. But the general gist of it was um, one of the Academy members actually said that joining the Academy was like building. When you're self-employed, you build a raft and you cast yourself out to sea. Joining the Academy is like tying your raft to a bunch of other rafts all going in the same direction. And I think that summarized it perfectly. I was like, that's amazing. Um, because what it is, it's a support network there, but it's not necessarily there to tell you how to do things. Yeah. Sometimes you just need confirmation from people in the same position as you that you're on the right path or making the right decision. You know, um, it can be a very lonely thing being self-employed, especially a one man or one woman band or, you know, even two, three people. Even if you're the boss and you're, you've got a few lads working for you, it's good to be able to speak to other bosses or yeah. other people for that kind of advice. And currently, there was just nothing out there to do that. Um, other than, as we mentioned before, Facebook forums and things like that, but there's quite a lot of negative experiences with those. So, yeah, the, the reason I set the Academy up was to offer to s some support and guidance to uh, people on their business journey. Um, and we've got a vast range of people within the Academy, people that have just started out, people that are in their first couple of years and people that have been in business 10 years plus um, that are just looking for guidance on various elements. Um, and there's a massive range of knowledge in there. So. Yeah, that's, uh, would you say that sums it up pretty well? That's, that's, that's perfect, yeah. I mean, 
I, I love it. I love the idea of it. Um, I think it's, but it's already proving very successful, isn't it? A lot of people have, going really have, well. have yeah. joined and a lot of people have seen some great results from it already. And, and yeah, sometimes, so, so basically to, to join uh, is a monthly fee, isn't it? There is, mate. Yeah. So we do, two, there's two main elements to the academy. So one being one-to-one -one tailored sessions. So whatever time period you want, really, but generally an hour, hour and a half or two hours. Yeah. Um, now, those are tailored one-to-one, -one, just me and the other person. And what I get them to do is drop me an email, um, basically outlining any areas of their business that they want to talk about, discuss, have some guidance with, help with. Um, and we'll tailor a very specific conversation to try and help out areas of people's business. The other side to the academy is the monthly membership, which is dead cheap. It's £9.99. It's less than a Domino's pizza is going to cost you. Yeah. Um, and for that, you will get access to an instant support group with all the other tradesmen, business owners in there. So at the minute, I think there's, there's over 20 uh, other businesses that are signed up. Um, and with that instant support group, you can drop a message in there any time of day or night. Um, basically, any issues that might come up, you know, what do you think about this? What would you use here? What would you do there? I've had this issue with a customer. Anyone help us with? Um, there's all sorts of questions come up. Um, it's a great little community. And then on top of that, there's also access to a Facebook page, which is a private page, which has got a load of preloaded content. Um, more like the videos I put out the other day, covering all sorts of elements of the painting and decorating industry. Um, and then I'm also doing a couple of uh, group Zoom sessions, or group Q&A sessions every month where people jump on, ask any questions they might have, run over any difficulties or even just have a catch up. Because, mm -hmm. again, it's a great little community in there. And as I touched on before, um, you know, it can be a lonely thing running your own business. And what I'm finding is a lot of people are just finding that connection of other people in the same position as them. Um, and, it, you know, there's people that are making friendships in there. Um, we've got plans of having an academy meet up at the Painting and Decorating show in November. Um, so, yeah, that, that's basically what's on offer. And for £9.99 a month, I would be amazed if people don't get value from that. But if oh, they don't get definitely. value from it, there's no contract, no cancellation. Drop me a message. You can cancel. In fact, if you don't get value from it, you want to drop me a message. Tell me it was a waste of time. I'll give you your money back. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm that confident that people are getting good value from it. So it's um yeah, it's it's working out really well. Um and uh yeah, it's great to be able to help people and to actually use my experience to help others along the way that are sort of starting out where I was twenty odd years ago. Mm. I think there's 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 massive value in communities like that, uh, amongst particularly self employed, sole trader businesses. Um, I think firstly, because you've got uh, you can you've got that whole pool of experience. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a community of experience, plus obviously your expertise, which has come from, you know, 20 years you've been in business now. Yeah. 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 Uh, and you've got it's not like other communities like Facebook groups and stuff like that. The people that are in this community, they're paying although nine ninety nine is very cheap. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, is great value, but by the very virtue that they're paying that, everyone in there is invested in it. Everyone's there because they want to get the best out of this and they want to help everybody else with it. Where you know you might go on the free decorating groups on Facebook and stuff yeah. like that, and people aren't invested in it in the same way. They're not there for the same yeah. reason. Some people are just there to have a laugh. Some people are there to take out their anger on other people with absolutely nice comments. Well, um, I think the, and, and the main I think thing that's really good. Well, the main thing there is I'm not appealing to the whole community of painters and decorators to come and join. Yeah. What I'm appealing to are the people that need help and guidance. Come and join and we can help. Yeah. Um, if you're out there, your business is flying, you're smashing it. Brilliant. Chuffed. I, I love it. Love to see people doing well. You know, I've got a lot of love for the industry as a whole. So I mm. love to see people doing really well. That's great. Fantastic. You know, you're probably not going to get value from joining the group because you're already very successful. Yeah, fantastic, brilliant. Um, but unfortunately, with the Facebook groups, you do get some people that don't need any help that are just there for some of the wrong reasons. And the academy is alleviating that 
you know people can come in and ask any question they see fit whether it, it might be a very amateur question um but you know everyone has a day one everyone has a yeah. week one everyone has a, a month one in business um and there's all sorts of questions that come up ranging from beginner to intermediate you know there's questions that come up in the group that i don't know the answer to um, but we've got other people in the group. Uh, one of the lads in there has been in business a long time and he's a self-proclaimed paint geek. Um, <laughs> and he knows the ins and outs of all the Caparol paints with all the long names and what they do and everything, uh, which hands up, it's more knowledge than what I've got um, because I've stuck to different products. Um, but within the collective of the group, yeah, there's a massive, massive amount of experience on so many different things. Yeah. Yeah. people everyone's at a different stage along their journey uh, and some people don't need it some people will need it and will get loads out of it uh, and yeah there's no such thing as a silly question you don't know what you don't know and uh, it's great great for people to have somewhere a, a community where they can go in and, and ask those questions and and offer support to other guys as well and I, I think it's brilliant. I'm going to put a link. I'm going to put a link to um, the website in the uh, show notes, and obviously, I'll, I'll uh, people you. can find you on. Uh, what's your Instagram handle so people can find you on there? Uh, it would be RDP Painters and Decorators. Um, the Academy one, I believe, there's a dash in there somewhere. <laughs> but it's uh, hold on, two seconds. I can get that for you. Find it. There we go. <laughs> Should have really known that off the top of my head. Uh, no, it's just RDP Academy. Oh, yeah. Oh, RDP look. Academy and RDP Painting and Decoration. It is, yeah. So. RDP Academy. Yeah. If you find either one, you'll find links to both um, and links to the website. So it's not too difficult to find. We are on Facebook as well. Same thing, RDP Academy. If you search that on Facebook or even search it on Google, it will come up there as well. Superb. Russ, I really appreciate your time, mate. It's been a brilliant conversation. I think we're going to help Absolute a lot. Absolute pleasure, this, mate. So. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, if any of you guys want to get some more from me, go to my website, jmears.co.uk slash ebook, and you can download my free ebook. Russ, once again, thank you very much, and we'll speak Pleasure, soon. Pleasure, John. Pleasure. Thanks, mate. Cheers. See you guys.